Triple chrome plating or decorative chrome consists of several layers of different metals electroplated onto a base metal to provide corrosion resistant and a highly polished decorative finish. In this training video we're going to show you how to set up the plating tanks and provide and control the power required to do the plating. We're going to use short lengths of half inch diameter copper pipe as our examples because this is something readily available that you can practice with over and over. Your most important reference point is the manual. Used in conjunction with this video, it should give you all the information you need to learn the techniques quickly. Remember, plating is more art than science, so before you get to plating real parts, make sure you can produce good results on these pipes. This also helps us give you good technical support. So, pull up an armchair and enjoy the movie. Our preferred method of shipping is with UPS. We are licensed to ship hazardous materials and our staff are regularly trained in the Department of Transportation regulations regarding these materials. Packages marked with these labels are only shipped UPS ground service. When you spot these labels, you should take extra care when opening and using these products. Hazardous materials are packaged separately from the rest of your order and arrive usually a few days later. As soon as your complete kit arrives, sort out the components into their respective tanks. Use the manual for reference. Check for any damage and report it to UPS. There are two copper kits, flash copper and acid copper. Make sure you don't mix these two kits together. You'll need to make a bench. Using 2x4s and plywood is very effective. Remember that there is going to be at least 300 pounds on the bench, so make it sturdy. It's a good idea to coat the wood in epoxy paint. Cut the holes in the bench so the tank lip sits on the bench top. Bus bars are a convenient way of getting power to all your tanks without tons of wiring. Use half inch diameter copper tubing. Place the bars on wooden blocks to raise them from the wall. Mark the top bar with a plus sign and the bottom bar with a negative sign. This is a complete tank setup using the flash copper tank as an example. There is a small red light on the heater to show when the thermostat has switched on. You may wish to install a thermometer. There's the filter pump, anode connected to the other anode, the tank bar connected to the negative bus bar, and finally the anodes are connected to the positive bus bar. You can prepare all your anodes and GP plates in the following manner. Cut a strip down the long side of the anodes. In the chrome anode shown here, the strip is about three quarters of an inch wide. Because all the other anodes use less current and are smaller, the strip may only be a quarter of an inch wide. Don't sever the strip from the anode as this is what serves as the electrical connection to the power supply. It also ensures that no foreign metals such as copper from copper wire or steel alligator clips enter the solution. Any metal other than the anode will dissolve because it is sacrificed like the anode and it will probably ruin your solution. The strips are placed at the front of the tank here for demonstration purposes, but they are better at the rear.
Here is the north end of a magnet. Imagine it is now the anode and we'll change our magnet force fields into anode force fields. The dissolved metal from the anode is transferred along the force fields towards the object being plated. When an object is placed into the force, it affects the lines of force. Non-metallic things such as plastic will divert the force's field. Metallic objects attract lines of force. Here a copper anode is plating a metal part. Notice how the lines of force are attracted to the corners and how this concentration of force has produced more plating in these areas. Here a copper cup is being plated with nickel. Only the rim and the bottom of the inside of the cup actually attract plating. The lines of force are mostly attracted to the rim being the nearest part. Note the thin and weak layer of plating at the bottom of the cup. The lines of force are attracted to the larger surface facing the anodes, so the sides of the part only receive a thin plate. More lines of force are focused on the sides by placing additional anodes. To plate the inside of a cylinder, the anode must be placed equidistantly from the cylinder wall. We've seen how the lines of force from an anode will concentrate on the nearest part of the object being plated. Now we will use an anode shaped to the same profile as the part to ensure the lines of force are all equally distanced from the part. These heaters are preset to 110 degrees. The black bulb on the wire is the thermostat, which must be placed in the solution. The rubber suckers can sometimes be difficult to use and we prefer to use a hook made of plastic coated wire. If you completely immerse the heater, you should take off the cap and place a good quantity of silicon rubber on the end of the heater. Replace the cap and wipe off the excess. This is the submersible filter pump. It's used in all plating tanks except the chrome tank. There are components here that are not required. There are two outlet caps. One has two outlets, the other just one. We need the one with one outlet. The thin length of tubing can also be discarded. The filter can be changed for a bag of activated charcoal when an organic cleanup is required. See the manual for details. The pumps come already assembled. All components are snap and click assembly. Make sure you remove the pump from the solution every day. The pump does three jobs. Filters the solution, keeps the solution temperature even and agitates the part. To conserve space you can remove the filter from the pump and just use the pump for agitation. You need to direct the pump outlet towards the workpiece. This will agitate the part and remove hydrogen bubbles that form during plating. If these bubbles aren't removed, fish eyes or pinholes may form in the plated surface because the plating forms around the bubble. There's a small plastic cap which must be placed over the nipple in the outlet tube. The SP degreaser uses a 300 watt ceramic heater which will bring the solution to a virtual boil. Add the SP degreaser powder at the approximate rate of one pound per two gallons of solution. Add the distilled water and the setup is ready to operate. SP degreaser is a soak only system. No power is normally required. from time to time use all four different pickles so extra tanks may be in order. These pickles are made from three basic acids muriatic or hydrochloric acid, pickle number four powder and battery acid. Pickle number one is a weak mix of water and muriatic acid usually used to mildly etch where bonding is a problem. Can also be used to strip chrome plate. Pickle number two is a more concentrated version of pickle number one, usually used for rust removal. 
Pickle number three is a mixture of battery acid and distilled water. You can also add two ounces of glycerin per gallon of solution. This prevents deep etching. This is often used for stripping and etching a nickel plate. Pickle number four is made of pickle number four powder and distilled water. This can be used to activate steel, remove rust, deoxidize copper and its alloys, and deoxidize zinc and die cast pot metal. It is also ideal for lead and lead based solder. Please consult the manual for more precise details on the use of pickles. There are three techniques for using pickles. Dipping, soaking and electro stripping. Here is the tank bar connected to positive. The GP plates are connected to negative. When stripping chrome and nickel use a higher voltage than when plating. Flash copper is supplied in liquid form. Add 4 quarts of part A, 1 quart of part B and 1 quart of part C and an equal amount of distilled water. Flash copper bonds to zinc and pot metal, steel, pewter, lead and brass. It can also bond to aluminum after the use of zincate as a primer. Flash copper uses the same type of anode as the acid system and it's advisable not to interchange these anodes. The tank operates with a heater and filter pump. This is the bright acid copper system. Battery acid is available from any Napa auto store. Always pour acid into water, not the other way around. Measure out the acid carefully. Add the distilled water to the tank. then add the battery acid. Remove the copper brightener from the pack. Slit the pack of crystals open and add the crystals to the tank. Finally add the copper brightener. Set the tank up in the normal way adding heater, nickel anodes and filter pump. Add the distilled water and then bring it up to temperature. You could also speed up this process by heating the water on a range to almost a boil. You can see a white dusty deposit floating on the tank. This is the boric acid which takes some time to dissolve. Run the pump for about three to four hours to thoroughly dissolve this material. Here is a chrome plating solution setup. Set up the heater and chrome anodes in the normal way. Add the bottles marked chrome catalyst. These contain the chrome catalyst, mist suppressant and sulfuric acid. Other than the chrome crystals and distilled water, no other additives are required. Carefully add the mist suppressant balls. Try to avoid splashing. Each time you start the chrome tank, plate a dummy item made of steel, copper or brass. 
The dummy should be fairly large, say at least 24 square inches in surface area. This operation plates out any contaminants and charges the tank ready for the real plating application. Using a clean sheet of paper, check the effectiveness of the miss at present by holding the paper over the chrome tank during the dummy plating operation. Add miss suppressant if the sheet is stained and keep a written log of this. We are going to use half inch diameter copper pipes as a plating workpiece. This will give you a consistent repeatable object which is easy to replace should you make a mistake. It also removes the variable of surface area from your training. Cut the half inch diameter pipes to 5 inches in length. This gives you approximately 8 square inches of total external surface area. Because the inside of these pipes is in shadow from the anode, more about that later, you can ignore it in the calculations. You should cut up at least a dozen lengths of pipe for this exercise. There are safe and unsafe areas on a buffing wheel. Make sure you know them before attempting this. Serious injury could result. Buff only in a safe area. Buffing above the safe area will result in the part being flung in your face. Buffing behind the safe area will result in the part being flung at the wall and then hitting you in the face. When using the wheel rake for cleaning, make sure it is in the safe area also. Prepare your copper pipes in the following manner. Use a 6 inch spiral sewn cotton wheel with the black compound. This is an aggressive cutting compound which will do a large part of the work. Notice how we only apply the compound to the wheel for about one second. Change over to the brown compound. Either clean the wheel or use a different one. Finally, change the wheel to a loose cotton or canton flannel wheel and buff with blue or brown compound. You should spend considerable time experimenting with the buffing procedure to become expert at this. Try different wheels with different compounds. Buffing is definitely an acquired skill and your entire plating project depends on your success here. When plating, remember, garbage in equals garbage out. As an alternative to buffing, vibratory tumbling will achieve high quality results automatically. There are numerous materials called media which can be used depending on the job in hand. Some are aggressive used for cutting down and others are extremely fine such as the crushed walnut shells being used here. After polishing the parts are ready to be degreased so hang them on the tank bars. Make the bars from copper pipe cut about 14 inches long. Flatten one inch of each end and bend to 90 degrees. This reduces movement. Attach the workpiece to the tank bar with copper wire. The small piece of tube is a stop enabling quick change of the part. Keep the tank bar clean to ensure good electrical contact. Hang the part on the bar so it will be completely immersed. The water break test is an important procedure when plating. It must be done at every stage of surface preparation immediately prior to plating. Bad surface preparation is the major cause of plating failures. Soft Scrub, the household work surface cleaner, is ideal for a final wipe down of parts prior to the water break test. Actually, if you find something fails the water break test, you can usually spruce it up with Soft Scrub. It's an aggressive product, yet it doesn't scratch polished surfaces. Great product. Let's look at controlling the power using light bulbs. 
Most small plating jobs can be powered using a 6 volt battery. You should use the same voltage bulbs. If you don't control the power with some sort of load in the circuit, you'll find the system will plate too fast, causing a rough heavy plate and it will probably overheat and melt the wires. Ideally a power supply or a rectifier would be the easiest thing to use. They have the disadvantage of cost. Light bulbs are cheap and easy to use once you understand how to do it. So here's our bright idea. Small light bulbs, readily available and inexpensive. Where do we put the bulbs? Right here between the positive battery terminal and the anodes. Which bulbs should we use? There are so many. Our 5 inch long pipes have calculated out at 8 square inches surface area. So first let's look at the nickel and copper plating power requirements. They both need 1 amp for 16 square inches of surface area. So we need half an amp to plate them. We could do that using five 100 milliamp bulbs or two 250 milliamp bulbs. We've learnt how to rate the bulb to the surface area being plated. Here are some examples of bulb ratings. A 100 milliamp bulb will plate about 1.5 square inches. Two 100 milliamp bulbs will plate about 3 square inches. A 250 milliamp bulb will plate 4 square inches. Two of them will plate 8 and four of them will plate 16. In this example we're going to plate a part with a total surface area of approximately 14 square inches which will require 14 sixteenths of an amp or 850 milliamps approximately. So three 250 milliamp bulbs and one 100 milliamp bulb will fit the bill perfectly. We've shown an ammeter here for the demonstration, but it really isn't necessary because you know what the current draw is from the bulb ratings. Here is a simple bulb rack using Radio Shack bulb holders. Screw the holders in a line onto a block of wood, then turn all the connectors to face the same way so you can thread some copper wire through them. You need to solder the wire onto the connectors. Connect the top wire to the battery and the bottom wire to the anodes. As soon as you place a bulb in the circuit, plating will commence. Here's our light bulb rack in full operation. This is the battery charger dimmer switch setup. We've added a calibrated ammeter to the circuit because the ones on chargers simply aren't accurate. At full current the part is bubbling violently. Of course this is not what we want, so the dial is turned down. Notice the bubbling is minimal when the ammeter shows less current. In this diagram the dimmer switch is wired to the power cord on the left. You could run two battery chargers from this outlet as long as they were exactly the same rating in output. This would effectively double your total amperage output. Power supply systems with variable amperage control are the ideal way to control the plating process. Their downside is cost, especially when the larger currents are required for chroming. The rectifier viewed here is a 25 amp machine, which will plate most small items up to 20 to 25 square inches in surface area, and it only costs a few hundred dollars. There are many larger power supplies or rectifiers available, from 100 to 1000 amps. These machines do a great job, but for the occasional chrome plating operation, their cost may be very prohibitive. A rule of thumb on pricing is to allow $1000 for every 100 amps, so a 500 amp machine could cost around $5000. The most effective, least expensive method of control is nichrome wire. Nichrome wire is an ideal material to use for controlling large currents. These wires will be operating at approximately 800 degrees Fahrenheit, so they need to be mounted on a fireproof cement board. 
Here we are attaching the main ground connector bars to a board. Measure 34 and a half inches from the common bar and mark it to place the other smaller bars. Using standard breaker box ground connectors we can cut these to our requirements. In our example here we are going to have one set of five wires, a set of three, a set of two and one single wire. These are all connected to one common ground on the left. The right hand connectors must be cut up to disconnect each bank of wires from one another. Make sure that you leave a couple of connecting points extra on each bar so that you have somewhere to insert the bolts and the wires. For a power controller we've selected 18 gauge wire. You need to cut up the wire to about 36 inches long so you have enough extra to clamp into the bars. Space all the smaller bars about half an inch apart. Heavier wire should be attached to the common bar as all the power will be drawn through it. The right hand smaller bars may use lighter wires with alligator clips attached so you may easily connect to the bus bars. The heavier wire on the left is the main power input from the batteries. On the right, smaller wires run off each block with alligator clips to connect to the positive bus bar. Here we're attaching the top block, 50 amps, and the bottom block, 10 amps, to give us a total of 60 amps. In this diagram you can see the banks of wires laid out. Note that they all connect to the main bar on the left. If you require more amperage than this setup allows, a total of 110 amps, simply add another bank of 5 wires. Don't forget to make allowances for the main input wire being able to carry the heavier loads. Our first plating job will be four copper pipes, five inches long and half an inch diameter, which equals eight square inches. Eight times four is 32 square inches and we need one amp for every 16 square inches. Therefore, we need two amps to do these four pipes. On the left this digital rectifier is showing 2 amps, on the right it shows 1.5 volts. We're going to plate for 30 minutes to give us half a thousandth of an inch. While we're waiting for those items to plate, let's look at where you would use different thicknesses of a nickel plate. Of course nickel is the real guts of a chrome plate, the chrome being merely a shiny protective layer for the nickel. On its own, chrome has very little corrosion resistance so it's important to get the right amount of nickel on. For decorative items, 15 minutes will give you a quarter of a thousandth of an inch. For tools and handguns, 30 minutes will give you half a thou. For a good base under chrome, marine, chemical or abrasive environments, plate for 60 minutes at one thousandth of an inch. Here are the four pipes duly nickel plated. We need to get the nickel as shiny as possible. So we either use the vibratory tumbler or we buff and polish it with the white and blue compounds. Finally clean with soft scrub to remove any buffing compound. Don't forget to do the water break test. Before starting chroming a batch you should plate a dummy to charge up the tank. We need 1 amp per square inch for chroming, so we need 8 amps to plate this part. Because the throw of power from the anode to the part is poor in chrome, it's best to plate each part individually, which will only take about 3 minutes. Note the heavier wire holding the part. After rinsing, give the parts a final buff or tumble to bring up the sparkle in the finish. Chrome has poor throwing powers. Sometimes you'll find that certain areas of a part haven't plated properly. This can be usually resolved by the use of conforming anodes. Here we've shaped a chrome anode into a cylinder to encompass our pipe. Now the anode is evenly spaced from the part and much closer. Less current will be needed to plate this part. See the section on hard chroming in the manual for many ideas on the use of conforming anodes. These concepts also apply to decorative chrome.
Acid copper is a heavy, high build material, ideal for filling in scratches and defects. It can't be used directly on steel or pot metal. These parts need to be plated with flash copper first. In this exercise, we're going to plate two pipes that have already been nickel plated. This will give you good practice at plating heavy layers of copper. Start off with two pipes, 8 square inches each, which equals 16 square inches total, which needs 1 amp current. After 15 minutes, remove one pipe and carry on plating the other for another 15 minutes. Don't forget to reduce the amps. Acid copper can be returned to the tank to add thickness. By repeatedly plating and sanding with fine wet and dry paper, pitted or defective surfaces can be built up to a smooth layer. The first pipe we plated should be buffed to see how effective a 15 minute plate is. Try plating other pipes for longer periods and test the plate by buffing. Sometimes you'll need to carry out some running repairs to a plated workpiece. Perhaps you didn't clean it well enough or the part was in shadow from the anode. Or maybe you were a little heavy handed with the buffer. Rather than having to do the piece over, brush plating has a really useful place in doing these sorts of repairs. A wand can be made from some quarter inch diameter stainless tube for nickel plating and a piece of copper tube for copper plating. The pipe should be about four inches long and flattened for about one and a half inches on one end. Connect a piece of plastic coated wire to the wand. Bear about an inch of the wire and crimp it in by squashing the other end of the tube. Wrap a strip of old t-shirt around the flat part and connect the wire to the positive bus bar. Connect the workpiece to the negative bus bar. Dip the wand into the solution and then stroke it up and down the defective area. The major part of a chrome plate is the nickel, so you need to practice plating this metal more than anything else. Try plating a pipe for different times, say 15, 30 and 60 minutes. Then check if your plate will stand a good buffing. If it fails, then look in the troubleshooting section of the manual to find the reason. Try acid and flash copper plating over the nickel. It's often a good idea to reverse plate for 30 seconds in the copper tanks to etch the nickel plate and improve adhesion. Try plating a copper pipe directly with chrome because sometimes it's difficult for the untrained eye to see the chrome over the nickel plate. This will show you the true color of the chrome. Try plating nickel over nickel. When you buff this, you'll soon see that it's important to activate the old nickel in battery acid to make the new nickel stick. Until you've mastered these skills, it's fruitless to try plating anything else. Keep practicing until you are happy with your results. And finally, don't take on any ambitious projects in the early days. Try and keep to straightforward smaller items. And stay away from pot metal and aluminum until you can confidently plate steel, copper and brass items.